Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, we are now into the 10th lecture of our course ADR and arbitration. We have been studying arbitration for last 7-8 sessions. Uh, towards the end, we will go back to some ADR aspects again. I said from section 10 to 15 is one scheme which talks about composition, which talks about arbitrators, their numbers, the procedure for appointment. We have discussed the numbers, we have discussed the procedure for appointment and we saw as to how section 11 is the most unsettled provision of this act of 1996, modified many times, modified by, by way of judicial decisions. So after having done section 10 and 11, now the present session will be on challenge to arbitrators. You can see the keywords we will be talking about bias. Uh, impartiality, ineligibility of arbitrators, what are the grounds to challenge an arbitrator, what, what is the procedure to challenge an arbitrator, things like that. So we will be drawing from what you know in, in principles of natural justice under administrative law which you must have studied. So we will be drawing something from there also. Why it is an important topic? Because arbitrators are not like judges, they are not full-time judges and therefore arbitrators come from all possible streams. A chartered accountant can be an arbitrator, a government servant can be an arbitrator. So therefore because arbitrators come from all possible streams, you cannot expect their mind to be like plain slate. They, they also have certain preconceived ideas about various things, predispositions some thoughts, some opinions, some understandings, some connections, some linkages. Therefore, possibility of bias cannot be ruled out. And therefore, in order to remove that possibility of bias or minimize the possibility of bias, you have a mechanism in this act to challenge the arbitrator. Because you see, in arbitration, heavy stakes are involved. Millions of dollars are involved in arbitration. Therefore, neutrality is an important value in the whole process of arbitration. Objectivity, fairness, neutrality, impartiality, independence of the arbitrator, these are important keywords in the process of arbitration. Uh, in the year 1990, there was a case reported in Wall Street Journal called as Mission Insurance Case, in which a huge award was turned down only on the ground that one of the arbitrators was seen spending time with one of the parties and therefore the conclusion was arrived at that there is no appearance of justice. If one of the arbitrators is seen spending time with one of the parties that means there is definitely some relationship whether bias operated against me is not the test. The bias must have operated against me. This thought itself makes the whole process bad. So therefore, we have a provision for challenging the arbitrators. 1940 Act also had a provision in section 11 subsection 2 which provided that an arbitrator who has misconducted himself or who has misconducted the proceedings could be challenged. So we had this ground but it was very Superficial, what do we mean by misconducting the proceeding, not clear. What do we mean by misconducting himself, not clear. So there were no, no clear guidelines and therefore a lot of litigation used to come precisely on section 11.2 that whether this amounts, this act of arbitrator amounts to misconducting the proceeding, whether this act of arbitrator amounts to misconducting himself. So that was a trouble creating provision, I can tell you. A lot of litigation was coming out of that. Now, we will not talk about 1940 legislation. I said section 10 to 15 is one scheme. 
out of that we have done section 10 11 12 to 15 relates to challenge to an arbitrator procedure to challenge you again get grounds some grounds in section 14 so there are grounds in 12 14 there are procedures in 13 14 and once an arbitrator is removed there is a possibility of finding a substitute in section 15 so we'll be discussing 12 13 14 15 in this session 12 gives me ground to challenge an arbitrator 14 also gives me grounds to challenge an arbitrator 13 gives me procedure to challenge an arbitrator 14 also gives me some procedure and once the arbitrator is challenged when the arbit once the arbitrator is removed how to get a substitute is provided by section 15 now let's come to the discussion there are three grounds on which you can challenge an arbitrator first there are three grounds on which you can challenge an arbitrator first the arbitrator lacks impartiality lack of impartiality or independence we'll understand the meaning of these terms what is impartiality what is imp independence how these two words are different from each other we'll understand in next slides so first ground on which you can challenge an arbitrator is lack of impartiality or lack of independence second is lack of agreed upon qualification parties agreed that we will appoint an arbitrator who shall have the qualification of m tech and and suppose uh, the appointed arbitrator come is is discovered to be a bachelor degree holder then that becomes a ground to challenge the arbitrator so lack of agreed upon qualification is the second and third lack of qualification which means that the arbitrator lacks the agreed upon qualification meaning thereby the arbitration does not possess the qualification which parties have mentioned in their arbitration agreement i have mentioned that i require a chartered accountant if it comes out to be a cost accountant that becomes a ground for for challenging the arbitrator so the first ground is lack of impartiality lack of independence the second ground is lack of qualification and the third ground is that the arbitrator is unable to devote sufficient time or unable to complete the arbitration in 12 months why this 12 months because this 12 months is related to section 29a which provides the timeline for completing the arbitration and section 29a says that the arbitration must be completed within the time frame of 12 months unless the time period is extended by the parties or extended by a competent court these three are the grounds on which uh, an arbitrator can be challenged i said we need to have these this provision because heavy stakes are involved in the process of arbitration and the person who is mostly appointed arbitrator are not full time arbitrators they are engaged in other professions so therefore as i said the possibility of connections uh, financial relationships personal relationships cannot be ruled out and there lies the importance of these grounds for challenging an arbitrator lack of impartiality lack of independence lack of qualification and the person is not able to devote sufficient time or he is unable to complete the arbitration in 12 months section 12 provides for grounds for challenging the arbitrator but it does not only provide for grounds for challenging the arbitrator it puts certain duties on any person who is approached to become an arbitrator suppose you come to me and request me to become an arbitrator i am under a duty by virtue of section 12 read with schedule 5 to make certain disclosures i'll talk about that section 12 requires any person who is approached to become an arbitrator to disclose circumstances which may cast doubt on his independence or impartiality what can be those circumstances because i am not aware as to what are those circumstances which must be disclosed to the party who is approaching me so therefore in order to help me what the law has done law has created a schedule fifth schedule it gives me illustrations of the grounds which if they exist then the arbitrator must definitely disclose it to the parties so 12 puts an obligation on any person who is approached to become an arbitrator to disclose all those grounds 
which may cast doubt on my independence and impartiality. What are those possible grounds? Those possible grounds are there in Schedule 5. If you look into Schedule 5, there are seven heads which you have there. There are 34 different grounds or kinds of relationships which have been mentioned in 5th Schedule. Any one of these, if exist, it is my duty to inform the party who has approached me to become an arbitrator in his case. Because any of these will cast doubt on my independence and impartiality. I may not be biased, but it is my duty to inform you that there, is a, there are circumstances which raise doubt on my independence. There are seven heads. All these 34 grounds have been divided into seven heads. You can read it in the fifth schedule. I will read the heads only for you. First is arbitrator's relationship with the parties or council. There is some personal relationship between, there is some direct relationship between the arbitrator and one of the parties. Or arbitrator and the council representing one of the parties. For example, the arbitrator is an employee or the arbitrator is a consultant or advisor of one of the parties. The arbitrator currently represents or advises one of the parties. So, there is a personal relationship, there is a relationship between the arbitrator and one of the parties or arbitrator and the council representing one of the parties. This is point number one. There are many subheads, there are many examples, many illustrations. Second, relationship of the arbitrator to the dispute. I have given advice to one of the parties earlier in relation to the same dispute. I was the advisor of one of the parties in relation to the same dispute. Then I am connected with the dispute. I will be biased towards my advice. You understand? So therefore, first is when there is a relationship between arbitrator and one of the parties or the council representing one of the parties. Second is there is a relationship between arbitrator and the subject matter, the dispute. Third. Arbitrator's direct or indirect interest in the dispute. Arbitrator stands to gain something. If the matter is decided this way or the other way, for example, the arbitrator holds share in the company which is one of the party to the dispute. I will definitely like to allow that company to win the case and so that the value of my shares will go up. So, I am financially involved. Fourth is previous service for one of the parties or other involvement in the case. The case which is presently before the arbitrator. In relation to the same case, the arbitrator at some other point of time in some other capacity was involved. Next is relationship between an arbitrator and another arbitrator or counsel. Next is relationship between arbitrator and party and others involved in the arbitration and then you have a list of other circumstances. What I am trying to say is, Schedule 5 is a comprehensive list of all possible circumstances which may raise doubt as regards the independence and impartiality of any person who is approached to become an arbitrator. So therefore, this is a sufficient guide for anyone to decide whether he has to make the disclosure or not. So if you approach me to become an arbitrator, the first thing I will do is to understand the nature of parties, to understand the dispute, look into fifth schedule and take a decision whether my case is going to fall in any one of these 34 entries or not. If my case is going to fall in any one of these entries, I am duty bound under section 12 to disclose those circumstances to the parties which may raise doubt as regards my independence and impartiality. Out of these seven heads which are there in fifth schedule, my, listen to me carefully. Out of these seven heads which are there in the fifth schedule, first three are of serious nature. Personal relationship with the party or financial relationship with the party or some relationship with the subject matter. Personal relationship, pecuniary relationship, relationship with the subject matter. These three are important aspects. And these three have been reproduced in another schedule called as seventh schedule. Seventh schedule gives me instances 
विच इफ एग्जिस्ट विल डिसेंटाइटल मी फ्रॉम बिकमिंग एन आर्बिट्रेटर इन योर केस टू एन अंडरस्टैंड ट्वेल्व गिव्स मी ग्राउंड फॉर चैलेंजिंग द आर्बिट्रेटर ट्वेल्व थ्री सेक्शन ट्वेल्व सब सेक्शन थ्री गिव्स मी ग्राउंड फॉर चैलेंजिंग द आर्बिट्रेटर वन ऑफ द ग्राउंड इज when there exist circumstances which cast doubt on my independence and impartiality what are those circumstances those circumstances have been listed in fifth schedule out of those seven heads first three heads are of serious nature so those three heads have been reproduced in seventh schedule seventh schedule disentitles anyone from becoming an arbitrator so fifth schedule is list of instances on which you can challenge an arbitrator seventh schedule is list of instances which decide ineligibility of a person to become an arbitrator second thing is fifth schedule grounds can be waived my duty is to inform you that one of these circumstances exist so there may be doubt on my independence that's all my job is done now it is for the parties to decide whether they still want to continue with me as an arbitrator or not so if they still want to continue they have the right to waive they have this option to waive their right to object and if they waive their right to object i can become their arbitrator but the grounds which are mentioned in seven schedule are of serious nature and these grounds cannot be waived so if i disclose the instances which fall in seven schedule then parties by way of agreement cannot waive their right to object if my relationship with one of the parties my relationship with the subject matter my pecuniary relationship is of a nature which finds place in seven schedule then i become ineligible and seven schedule grounds cannot be waived so waiver is possible in fifth schedule waiver ordinarily is not possible in seventh schedule but there is only one condition where some some autonomy has been recognized waiver with respect to seventh schedule that means you want to waive your right to object you don't want to say that a biased person is is sitting to decide the case you don't want to say that you want to waive your right to object this is possible with respect to seventh schedule when you do it in writing so oral waiver is not possible with respect to seventh schedule first point second you do it in writing that too after the dispute has come into existence so it is a matter which can be waived after a emergence of dispute post dispute situation so this prior to emergence of dispute you cannot take a decision to waive your right to object with respect to seven schedule grounds that can be waived only in writing that too after the dispute has emerged this is a very important point you will understand at the time when i am offered a contract every relationship starts on a on a positive note so we don't we don't think in terms of resolution of dispute tomorrow we are going to fight there will be a dispute the matter will go for arbitration so therefore we are on a positive note and we are willing to agree for everything so if the employer who is going to give me a letter will say that i want to keep my uh, managing director as arbitrator in case of any dispute arising out of employment contract between you and me i will immediately agree fine that is okay to me sir because he is giving me the job so at that stage whatever i am doing it is being done under some implied pressure it is always possible that one party may not have the same bargaining power and therefore he agrees to many of the unreasonable demands of the other party so therefore any pre dispute agreement will not be sufficient to waive your right to raise an objection with regard to any relationship which falls in seventh schedule ineligibility remains ineligibility but once the dispute comes into existence the parties are on equal terms and once parties are on equal terms and still they want to waive their right to object then law will allow you you can do it now 
you can accept an ineligible person to become an arbitrator in your case provided you do it after the dispute has come into existence and provided you do it in writing so that is what you have in fifth schedule that is what you have in seventh schedule the duty to disclose existence of those circumstances which may cast doubt on independence and impartiality is a continuing duty it is based on the principle of uberima fides principle of uberima fides you must have studied it in insurance law or you may do it in insurance law it is a continuous duty utmost good faith so the relationship between the company and the insured is based on uberima fides utmost good faith same is the case here at inception a person may not be biased but during the proceeding it may happen that he may acquire some biasness at any stage of the proceeding if he becomes biased if those circumstances come into existence he has to disclose it for example counsel x is representing one of the parties i am the arbitrator for five hearings counsel x was representing and suddenly they changed their advocate now counsel y has come and counsel y is related to me suppose there immediately it is my duty to inform the parties that look there is a relationship between me and the counsel representing one of the parties you have to take a call whether i continue or you want to waive your right to object it is always possible to waive if the grounds fall in fifth schedule but it is not possible to waive if the ground falls in seventh schedule so therefore it has to be decided by the parties but you have to keep in mind that there is a timeline to raise an objection of jurisdiction when i become biased what happens i lose jurisdiction when i become biased i lose jurisdiction and any objection in relation to lack of jurisdiction has to be raised according to the timeline which we have discussed in section 162 you have to raise the objection immediately when you come to know about lack of jurisdiction the moment you come to know about biasness the moment you come to know about lack of jurisdiction you have to raise it immediately that is what section 162 says so therefore duty to disclose is a continuous duty it is based on the principle of uberima fides and the objection must be raised immediately when the party comes to know about the possibility of existence of one of those circumstances which cast doubt on independence and impartiality of the arbitrator the doubt has to be justifiable doubt justifiable doubt this phrase has been borrowed from ancestral model law so the doubt is not based on vague suspicion of unreasonable people that is not the test the test is that the 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 doubt as regards lack of independence and impartiality must be justifiable there is a case called as westel pine sheen and gmbh versus delhi metro rail corporation limited air 2017 in which court explains the words independence and impartiality but before we decide discuss it I, i i may tell you that section 12 says that the ground on which arbitrator can be challenged is lack of impartiality or independence independence or impartiality lack of independence or impartiality section 67 of the act in part 3 in law relating to conciliation says the conciliator must be independent and impartial so here you have independence or impartiality there you have independence and impartiality i don't understand whether these two are synonymous or not so on first reading somebody may come to the conclusion that word or has been used to probably independence and impartiality are synonymous but that is not true these two are different words in hostel pine versus delhi metro rail corporation 2017 supreme court court says independence and impartiality of the arbitrator are the hallmarks of any arbitration proceeding if you lack independence you lack impartiality the entire proceeding shall be vitiated 
कोच सेज रूल अगेंस्ट बायस इज वन ऑफ द फंडामेंटल प्रिंसिपल्स ऑफ नेचुरल जस्टिस विच अप्लाइज टू ऑल जुडिशियल एंड कोसाई जुडिशियल प्रोसीडिंग्स नेचुरल जस्टिस मस्ट नॉट बी अलाउड टू बी रिमूव फ्रॉम द एप्लीकेशन ऑफ आर्बिट्रल प्रोसीडिंग्स इंडिपेंडेंस एंड इम्पार्शियलिटी आर हॉलमार्क ऑफ एनी आर्बिट्रेशन प्रोसीडिंग्स एंड देन कोर्ट एक्सप्लेन्स द मीनिंग ऑफ दीज टर्म्स इंडिपेंडेंस एंड इम्पार्शियलिटी आर टू डिफरेंट कंसेप्ट an arbitrator may be independent and yet lack impartiality and vice versa these two are two different concepts you can see here impartiality as is well accepted is a more subjective concept as compared to independence so according to court independence is more objective concept impartiality is relatively more subjective as compared to independence how court says independence which is more an objective concept may be more straightforwardly ascertained by the parties at the outset of the arbitration proceeding in light of the circumstances disclosed by the arbitrator in the light of circumstances which arbitrator has disclosed in the light of circumstances which arbitrator has disclosed the aspect of independence may be ascertained so therefore what what court is trying to say is if there is a relationship between party and the arbitrator if there is some financial relationship of the arbitrator with the subject matter personal relationship relationship of arbitrator with the subject matter or pecuniary relationship if that is disclosed in the beginning itself then one can easily make out whether the arbitrator is going to be independent or not so independence is a more objective concept which can be discovered on the basis of disclosure made by the person who is going to be appointed as an arbitrator whereas impartiality will surface during the arbitration proceeding let's apply your understanding of administrative law your understanding of principles of natural justice you have studied the rule against bias lord denning says justice is rooted in public confidence and public confidence gets eroded when a right thinking man goes away thinking that the judge was biased rule against bias does not only mean that no one should be judge in his own case rule against bias does not only mean nobody should be a judge in his or her own case it also means justice must not only be done it must be seen to be done appearance of justice important as justice itself and therefore in various cases courts have evolved two principles two tests to determine biasness biasness can be of three kinds you must have studied in administrative law personal bias when there is a relationship between judge and one of the parties this can be positive relationship friendship this can be negative relationship vengeance ill will bad faith so there can be negative relationship both can make the judge biased either in favor of a party or against that party second is pecuniary relationship the judge has some financial relationship with the outcome of the case the judge must stand to gain or lose something out of that judgment third is subject matter bias i was the person who initiated the process of premature retirement for example and i am the person who is entertaining the appeal against that order i will always be biased in favor of the decision which i have already taken so bias can be partiality can be personal bias pecuniary bias and subject matter bias that is what we have in the seventh schedule also first three heads are what personal bias pecuniary bias subject matter bias and these have been reproduced in seventh schedule first three heads of fifth schedule are personal bias pecuniary bias subject matter bias these have been reproduced in seventh schedule and there are two tests as i was referring to there are two tests to determine bias 
वन इज रियल लाइकलीहुड ऑफ बायस द अदर इज रीजनेबल सस्पेशन ऑफ बायस रियल लाइकलीहुड ऑफ बायस इज वेन देर इज सम रिलेशनशिप स्टैब्लिश बिटवीन जज एंड वन ऑफ द पार्टीज वेन देर इज सम रिलेशनशिप स्टैब्लिश बिटवीन जज एंड वन ऑफ द पार्टीज दैट इज अ केस ऑफ लाइकलीहुड ऑफ बायस वेर लाइकलीहुड इज रियल as i have already mentioned it is not important to say whether bias operated against me the apprehension that bias must have operated against me is sufficient so when a relationship is established between judge and one of the parties is the case of real likelihood of bias that is what supreme court in versal point case says is the case of lack of independence when a relationship is established between arbitrator and one of the parties in the beginning itself you can find out there is a real likelihood of bias and that case is called as lack of independence in the judgment of westil pine versus dmrc delhi metro rail corporation the second test in rule against bias is reasonable suspicion of bias even if no relationship is established between the judge and one of the parties so therefore it is not a case of real likelihood of bias it is not a case of lack of independence but there can still be bias there can still be a bias which has to be discovered on the basis of outward appearance of the proceeding it can be discovered on the basis of outward appearance of the proceeding the inclination of the person towards a particular party can be visible if you look at the proceeding from outside the judge is inclined towards one party judge con- constantly supports the views given by the counsel representing one of the parties there is an appearance of biasness so even if there is no relationship established even if it is not a case of lack of independence it can still be a case of lack of impartiality if the overall appearance of the proceeding suggests suspicion of bias that is what court says independence is more objective it can be determined at the beginning itself on the basis of disclosure made by the person who is approached to become an arbitrator whereas impartiality lack of impartiality will surface during the proceedings so therefore these two words independence and impartiality of arbitrators are the hallmark of any arbitration proceeding rule of rule against bias is a fundamental principle of principles of natural justice and so there should not be any waiver independence is more objective concept as compared to impartiality independence is judged on the basis of relationship which dis, which is disclosed by the arbitrator whereas impartiality lack of impartiality will surface during the proceeding the next point is ineligibility fifth schedule as i said contains more than 30 grounds all that have been borrowed from orange list of the international bar association guidelines on conflict of interest in international arbitration we have the orange list on which you have your fifth schedule based some of the entries have been taken from red list also seventh schedule is based on red list red list gives you instances which talk about complete ineligibility of a person to become an arbitrator same is the case with seven schedule seven schedule lists the grounds which talk about complete ineligibility of a person to become an arbitrator if my relationship with the subject matter if my relationship with one of the parties fall in seven schedule i am absolutely ineligible to become an arbitrator that is what you have in section 12 sub section 5 it is mentioned that section 12 subsection 5 says not withstanding any prior agreement to the contrary whatever you must have written in your agreement any person whose relationship with the parties or counsel or the subject matter of the dispute falls under any of the categories specified in 7 schedule shall be ineligible to be appointed as an arbitrator whatever you must have written in your agreement you may have written that mr x who is actually ineligible will become an arbitrator that is of no use anything which you have, must have written in your agreement if the relationship of that person with the subject matter 
with the party or with the council representing the party falls in seventh schedule, he becomes ineligible to, to become an arbitrator. But as I said in the past, some limited autonomy has to be recognized. How? Such persons, such ineligible persons can still be appointed as arbitrator provided you take this decision to go ahead with us with such ineligible person after dispute has come into existence and you take this decision in writing. So parties can waive their right to object to the appointment of ineligible person as an arbitrator only when they waive their right in writing that too after the dispute has come into existence. Fifth schedule is based on orange list of IBA International Bar Association guideline. Seventh schedule is based on red list. All these were part of the recommendation of Law Commission of India, 246th Law Commission report. And therefore, all this scheme of fifth schedule and seventh schedule, all this came in 2015 amendment. Prior to 2015 amendment, we had section 12 in place. The grounds were there. There was a duty to disclose the circumstances which may cast doubt on independence and impartiality. But the detailed grounds were missing. Fifth schedule was missing. Seventh schedule was missing. There was nothing like ineligibility, which now you see in section 12, subsection 5. So therefore, what we have studied so far, we have studied that 12.3 gives us grounds to challenge an arbitrator lack of impartiality, lack of independence, lack of qualification. We also have an additional ground which you don't have in 12.3 but it is there in 12 which says that the arbitrator is unable to devote sufficient time, arbitrator is unable to complete arbitration in, in 12 months. These are the grounds on which an arbitrator can be challenged. The person who is approached is under a duty to disclose circumstances which may cast doubt on his independence, impartiality. If those grounds fall in fifth schedule, it can be waived. He can still be appointed. But if those grounds fall in seventh schedule, it can never be waived. It can only be waived only at a stage when the dispute has come into existence. That too in writing. But, but otherwise, such persons whose relationship with subject matter whose relationship with one of the parties, whose relationship with one of the councils representing parties falls in seventh schedule, is ineligible to become an arbitrator. I hope you understand this much. If you understand the grounds of ineligibility, grounds to challenge an arbitrator, now we can talk about procedure to challenge the arbitrator. Section 13 provides the procedure. How to challenge an arbitrator? But there is an important point here that section 13 provides you the mechanism to challenge an arbitrator on grounds of section 12.3. There are two grounds in section 12.3 if you remember. First, lack of independence, lack of impartiality. Second, lack of requisite qualification. So 13 is not available for the grounds of ineligibility in 12.5. Listen to me carefully. 13 gives me procedure to challenge an arbitrator only when the grounds are lack of independence, lack of impartiality, lack of qualification. It is not a procedure to challenge an arbitrator who is ineligible by virtue of 12.5. So, only 12, 3 grounds can be raised under section 13. What is 13? 13 is a two level mechanism. It provides two levels. First, it provides freedom to the parties to prepare the challenge procedure for their own. If you want to challenge the arbitrators, what shall be the procedure you will follow? You are free to design it, party autonomy. Parties have the freedom to decide what shall be the procedure to challenge an arbitrator. But then there is certain mandatory aspect. As I have been saying since beginning that this act balances mandatory and non-mandatory parts. So we have the freedom to design our procedure. But at the same time there are mandatory requirements. You must definitely have the requirement of subsection 4 and subsection 5 in your procedure. What is subsection 4? 
Subsection 4 says, whatever is the challenge procedure, you decide for yourself. If the challenge to an arbitrator fails, then arbitration shall continue. You cannot create some other challenge there. Once the challenge fails, the arbitration shall continue and an award shall be passed. This is there in subsection 4. Subsection 5 says, this award can be challenged only in section 34 at a later point of time. So whatever procedure you have, it must definitely have the requirements of subsection 4 and subsection 5. The procedure must also include the requirement of section 18 of the Act. We'll talk about it maybe later on. Section 18 is equality provision. The tribunal shall remain equal with both the parties. So these are the safeguards which you must have in your procedure. But if parties do not design a procedure to challenge arbitrators for themselves, then there is a default provision given here, default procedure given here. Once a party becomes aware of any ground of challenge which is there in 12.3, the moment you come to know about existence of one of the grounds, it is your responsibility to raise the challenge. How will you raise the challenge? You will send a written statement of the reasons for the challenge to the arbitral tribunal itself. There is some timeline given within these many days you do it. So once you come to know about existence of grounds to challenge an arbitrator, you write it to the arbitral tribunal. So you are challenging the arbitrator before the tribunal itself. You are challenging the arbitrator before the tribunal itself. Now it is for the arbitrator who is challenged to either withdraw or stay there. If the arbitrator who is challenged withdraws, resigns, or if the other party agrees to the challenge which I have raised, then the mandate of that arbitrator terminates. If these two situations are there, it is fine. Otherwise, what will happen? The tribunal shall decide the merit of that challenge. Tribunal shall decide whether the arbitrator is to be removed or not. Now, the problem is in relation to a situation where it is a case of sole arbitrator. If the tribunal consists of one arbitrator and I am challenging that arbitrator only, will that arbitrator resign? And if he does not resign and if the other party does not agree to the challenge, then what will happen? That same tribunal, same arbitrator is deciding the fate of the arbitrator. So there is always a possibility of biasness. He will always be biased in his own favor. Therefore, section 13 is criticized at times that the mechanism, default mechanism provided in section 13 to challenge an arbitrator is defective, at least in cases where there is only one arbitrator in tribunal. In case of three arbitrators, there can always be a decision by remaining two. But the problem is definitely grave when it is a case of sole arbitrator. But that is the problem, we, that is the provision we have. Section 14.1a gives you few more grounds for termination of mandate of the arbitrator. 14.1a provides few more grounds for termination of mandate of an arbitrator. These are grounds of inability and failure. Inability of an arbitrator can be because of various reasons. It can be de jure inability. It can be de facto inability. De jure inability means, for example, the person is barred by law. There may be legal incapacity. He may be convicted for an offense. So therefore, he is unable to perform his duty as an arbitrator. In that situation, the mandate must terminate. Second, de facto inability. For example, prolonged illness, continuous ill health. He is unable to devote time and perform his job as an arbitrator. That can be the basis to terminate the mandate. Or he is unable to devote time because of any other reason. De jure inability, de facto inability or his inability because of any other reason. If he is unable to perform his duty, if there is failure in performing the duty because of any one of these reasons, that should be the basis to terminate the mandate of that arbitrator. Remove the arbitrator. 
But 13 provides you mechanism to challenge arbitrator only on the ground of 12.3, not on the ground of 14.1a. Where will you raise the ground of 14.1a? 14.1a can be raised in section 14.2. 14.2 says if a controversy remains concerning any of the grounds referred to in clause A of subsection 1, a party may, unless otherwise agreed by the parties, apply to the court to decide on termination of the mandate. So, grounds of 12.3 can be raised in 13. There are additional grounds in 14.1a. These are inability and failure. Inability to devote time, inability to complete my work, inability to perform my duty as an arbitrator because of Various regions, it can be de jure inability, de facto inability, inability because of any other region. If, if you want to challenge me on any of the grounds mentioned in 14.1a, you don't have to go to 13, you have to file a case in 14.2. The grounds of challenge of 12.3 have to be raised in 13 before the tribunal itself. But the grounds of challenging which you have in 14.1a have to be raised before the court in section 14.2, not before the tribunal. So, there are two challenge procedures also, 13 and 14.2. 13 for 12.3 grounds, 14.2 for 14.1a grounds. Now, why I am referring to 14.1a grounds? Because in the entire process, one thing is missing if you, if you carefully Listen to me, there is one thing which is missing. 12.3 grounds in 13 before the tribunal. 14.1a grounds in 14.2 before a court. Where will you raise 12.5 grounds, ineligibility grounds? We don't have a provision which talks about the procedure to raise grounds of ineligibility as you find in section 12.5. There is a case called as HRD Corporation, Marcus Oil and Chemical Division versus Gale India Limited, 2017. The issue of deciding challenge procedure for the grounds of section 12.5 was discussed. Because we know 12.3 in 13, 14.1a in 14.2. Where to raise the point of 12.5? Ineligibility. Court says that a person is ineligible as you can see in this slide, grounds of 12.3 read with schedule 5 can be raised in 13 before the tribunal. It has to be raised before the tribunal. It cannot be raised before the court at that stage. The matter can be raised before the court only once the award is passed. Whereas 14.1a matters can be raised before the court immediately. You don't have to wait till the award is passed. And you don't have to go to the tribunal. So, 12, 12 3 grounds in 13, 14-1A grounds in 14-2 before the court. Now, what court in HRD Corporation case said that ineligibility of 12-5 means de jure inability of 14-1A. So that's important. Ineligibility of 12-5 means disability or inability of 14.1a. That means if I am ineligible by virtue of 12.5 means what? I am barred by law to become an arbitrator. I have become unable to perform my work by virtue of law. So, this is de jure inability. And if 12.5 ineligibility is nothing but de jure inability, De jure inabilities are raised under 14.2 before a court. So, the place, the forum or the provision under which you can raise the ground of ineligibility of 12.5 is 14.2, that is the court. So, now the, the scheme is clear. 12.3 grounds can be raised in section 13 before the tribunal. 14.1a grounds can be raised before the court in 14.2. 12.5 grounds are same as 14.1a grounds, so therefore 12.5 grounds will also be raised before the court in section 14.2. But there is an interesting point here, section 14.2, if I go back to the previous slide, 
you can see 14.2 says if a controversy remains concerning any of the grounds referred to in clause A of subsection 1, a party may, then you have unless otherwise agreed by the parties. Unless otherwise agreed by the parties, apply to the court to decide on termination of the mandate. 14.2 is not a mandatory provision. It is subject to party autonomy. That means parties can always exclude application of 14.2 from their arbitration. And if they exclude application of 14.2, the entire application of 12.5 depends on 14.2. The entire process of challenging ineligible arbitrator is there in 14.2. What if the parties by ignorance or by intention have already excluded application of 14.2 from their arbitration because it is subject to party autonomy unless otherwise agreed by the parties. Parties can agree for something else. Parties can decide to exclude application of 14.2. 14.2 is subject to party autonomy. Now, therefore, what I am trying to say that such an important provision 12.5 have been made dependent on 14.2 which itself is not a mandatory provision and can be excluded. So, that is a catch which has to be looked into. If you go back to uh, the previous slide once again, you see you have section 12.5 mentioned here. Notwithstanding any prior agreement to the contrary, any person whose relationship with parties, counsel, this falls in seven schedule is ineligible to become an arbitrator. What do you mean by notwithstanding any prior agreement? It means whatever you must have written in the prior agreement. Now, today the story is ineligible person cannot be appointed as an arbitrator. So, if an ineligible person cannot be appointed as an arbitrator, who will be appointed as an arbitrator then? Contract says Mr. X has to be appointed as an arbitrator. Agreement between the party says Mr. X has to be the arbitrator. Today, it is discovered that Mr. X has a relationship with one of the parties which falls in seven schedule. So, it is clear that Mr. X cannot be appointed as an arbitrator. Then who will be the arbitrator? How to decide it? What is the effect of this non obstant clause? You see here on this slide, the last point, effect of non obstant clause in, in section 12.5. If agreement provides for appointment of ineligible person, as I said, Mr. X has to become an arbitrator. Today, it is discovered that Mr. X is ineligible to become an arbitrator. If agreement provides for appointment of ineligible person, the situation is as if the agreement does not provide for appointment at all. If agreement provides for appointment of ineligible person, the situation is as if the agreement does not provide for appointment of arbitrator at all and in that case, the procedure of section 11 shall be followed and the court can deviate from the agreement and appoint a person who shall be fit in that given case. There is one last point left. I have made a summary of all the provisions under which mandate of an arbitrator terminates. It is a summary of all the provisions under which mandate of an arbitrator terminates. First is automatic termination. It happens by death of arbitrator, needless to say. Second, automatic termination in 14.1a. That is when it is a case of de facto and de jure inability, it is automatic termination. Third, the, the mandate of an arbitrator shall terminate when a final award is passed under section 32. If you recall, I said the tribunal becomes defunct. So, these are the cases of automatic termination. Then you have termination by the arbitrator. Arbitrator himself may terminate. It is a kind of contract between parties and the arbitrator. And therefore, it can be resigned by either of the party. The arbitrator can resign. You have the possibility of resignation in 15, in 13. Termination of proceeding section 32, subsection 2. If the claim is withdrawn, the matter has to be terminated. If there is no claim, what has to be decided? If parties agree to terminate the mandate of entire tribunal, the mandate terminates. There are situations at times when the tribunal comes to the conclusion that no useful purpose is going to be served even if we continue with the arbitration. That is the case when the mandate terminates, the, the arbitrator terminates it. The third situation is termination of mandate of arbitrator by the parties 
you have it in section 13 i challenged an arbitrator the other party agreed to the challenge second is withdrawal of claim i withdraw the claim the matter comes to an end settlement section 30 we'll talk about it later on when the parties go and settle the matter then the mandate of arbitrators terminate there may be termination by tribunal order section 13 subsection 3 there are three possibilities the challenged arbitrator can resign the other party can agree to the challenge and mandate terminates third possibility the tribunal decides about the fate of that arbitrator and removal by court can happen in section 14 2. the last important point is section 15 i said 12 to 15 constitute one scheme arbitrator is challenged arbitrator is removed how to find a substitute section 15 says a substitute has to be found by applying the same rule which you applied to appoint the original arbitrator a substitute has to be has to be appointed by applying same rule which you applied for appointment of original arbitrator who has been removed now second the new arbitrator comes he joins it is for the parties to decide whether they want to conduct the proceedings afresh with the new arbitrator or whether they want the new arbitrator to start conducting the proceeding from the stage where the earlier arbitrator has left supreme court has been time and again insisting on enhancing encouraging professionalism in arbitration and they have been insisting on governments avoiding the situation of appointing serving employees as arbitrators so we have discussed the importance of principles of natural justice here we understood that the grounds to challenge arbitrators are very important to remove the element of bias we must have independent and impartial arbitrators because these two words are hallmark of any arbitration proceeding that's all we have in sections 12 to 15 in in next session probably we'll talk about the the powers of the arbitral tribunal may be in section 16 as well as section 17. so that's it for the present session thank you very much Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I'm not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I'm also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude, immoral, vulgar, and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare, as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. 
Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets.